My work centers on Gogo's soup kitchen, based in Gugulatu, Cape Town. Similar to a food bank, soup kitchens in South Africa are run by volunteers, but often with no state aid. The work draws on the soup kitchen as a site of micropolitics, a form of state power that is exercised at a minute but embedded level, through surveillance, discipline, and threat. The micropolitics of the soup kitchen make it a site of convergence between the everyday violence of going hungry and the large-scale, long-standing, all-encompassing spatial violence of apartheid and the colonial regime. The existing soup kitchen operates with principles of Ubuntu, a South African phrase meaning humanity, or I am because we are. Gogo started the soup kitchen in the COVID pandemic, and it has remained, becoming a resilient infrastructure. More than just providing food, Gogo's kitchen is a space of civicness in an area of Cape Town that has been violently planned to lack them. This is an incredible labor carried out by Gogo and her volunteers. Through my work at the AA, I have become involved in securing funding from the Maid Foundation. We are currently trying to get registered as an NGO, which improves cre credibility and allows us to open a bank account. The work I am presenting today posits a scenario in which reparations can be multi-scalar and multimodal, looking at repair on the legislative, neighborhood, as well as material scale. Not only this, it takes a position on how we practice architecture, asking us to reconsider our methodologies, reconsider our top-down planning practices, as those that have only continued to produce spatial segregation. It asks us how we might practice architecture ethically in an unethical system. Conversations around reparations have long existed in South Africa, but very little material change has been made, forcing such resilient infrastructures to persist. I argue that it is the architect's responsibility to make such resilient infrastructures, such as Gogo's kitchen, as safe as possible, as quickly as possible, but also to look at it as an exemplar, something that works, something that we can learn from. The work is therefore concerned with providing a toolkit, which contains three parts. The first is focused on amending the zoning law to include a category for community care facilities. The second part is the architectural proposal, proposing small but powerful changes with the goal to make operations within soup kitchens smoother, safer, and where possible, economically sustainable. The final part is documents, interviews, and messages regarding funding and budgeting, which I am gathering through the process of registering the kitchen as an NGO. The toolkit learns from Gogo, and in so doing, argues not for some abstracted ideal. It sees the soup kitchen as a way to make legible what is often rendered intangible. It's how micro and macro politics converge. The toolkit therefore targets the granular, working from the inside out. It makes these methodological moves as a way to ethically practice architecture in this context. The soup kitchen is located in Gugulatu, which is a township about 20 minutes drive on the N2 out of Cape Town. Gugulatu is considered a formal township, meaning it is part of an incremental housing zone stated in the City of Cape Town Zoning Regulation, the document that determines what uses are permitted on what land. In fact, these formal and informal zones of Cape Town are traces that remain of the borders set out during apartheid to divide people by race. Often informal areas are historically where the state forced black people to live. These townships were intentionally deprived of civic and public space, and this is still felt today. People living in Gugulatu often have to travel to go to the park or do grocery shopping. This is because the state has never truly made systemic legislative change since the end of apartheid and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Instead, the state relies on resilient infrastructure, incredible collective efforts, to fill its absence. But this creates an uncomfortable tension. Can the state ever truly be absent? Perhaps it is more accurate to say that the state intentionally authorizes its absence, choosing not to provide infrastructure to these historically deprived areas, choosing not to improve their civicness, leaving gaps to be filled by communities. I think that the state's absence is often better described as a presence, and a strong one at that. But this interrelation between the present absence of the state and these gaps being continually supplanted by resilient infrastructures is actually what reproduces spatial segregation over and over again. Such spatial segregation can be macro-political in nature, such as within authoritarian regimes like apartheid, 
where violence is unplanned demolitions and entire areas being planned to lack civic or public space. In the new South Africa, a sovereign state, state power is better understood on the micro-political scale. Sovereign power is exercised selectively through governance, through surveillance and spectacle, and through the threat of violence. It is through this threat of violence and the spectacle that the state remains present in Gogo's kitchen and shows itself the day it decides the operation is non-compliant. This top-down legislative ideal of compliance is a further way the present absence of the state is felt. It leads to dichotomies and conflicts that often manifest spatially or architecturally, making practicing architecture challenging. In many cases, informal or resilient infrastructures will not be compliant. Perhaps the building is not equipped for that use. Perhaps that use is not permitted in that zone. This top-down standard often makes it harder or more dangerous for necessary infrastructures to operate. So a critical view of compliance law is important. But in moments of immediate need such as this one, we should not abandon it. These documents protect people's safety. Rather, I believe we should reconsider the way we think about compliance, how and where we apply it, and take it rather to be a spectrum where safety is paramount. Establishing a compliance spectrum within legislation frees initiatives like Gogo's to make small changes that have a large impact on how they operate. It is such amendments to zoning and building regulation that I propose in the first section of the toolkit. I suggest to amend zoning law to include a category for community care facilities where a compliance spectrum approach should be applied and section 15 of food premises regulations to include exemptions with reference to the spectrum understanding of compliances. The second part of the toolkit learns from Gogo, taking her soup kitchen as a case study, an exemplary evidenced space. Through interviewing Gogo, I could understand the way the space is used and what small gestures might facilitate and ameliorate Gogo's labor. Here is Gogo on how she navigates the kitchen. Yeah, because remember, my kitchen is not to yeah, be like the yeah. soap will be at your back and the pot will be on your front. Actually, my volunteers every evening fill up two pots, one pot for porridge, oats or porridge. Yeah. 160 liters, they fill it up with water for the following day. I put um, eight, liters, eight liters of water yeah. when I'm preparing rice. Eight yeah. liters of water and then in a 160 liters pot. And then I add 30 kg of rice. I fry the meat. So I wrap the meat in the, in the chicken in a spicy flour. Yeah. The flour, then I roll it in there. Then I boil the oil and I fry it in there. Yes, I, okay. I mix my flour with mm-hmm. Then I throw the chicken in there bit by bit mm-hmm. and then fry it. Then for another one. Yes. <sighs> Even with the chicken next. Even with the chicken next, I do the same. The same. Nice. Mm. The other one will be dishing rice, the other one will be dishing another thing, and the other one will be dishing. Our, bowl, our containers, uh, their containers, we put stickers now with their name. Okay. Ice cream is butter, is whatever container that we can get. Okay. We've got two men. So uh, they come, the other one comes at 7, mm. and the other one comes at 12 for 1. Mm. So they make sure that all the pots are washed. Learning from Gogo and working outwards, what small interventions could be applied today to make the operation safer and more comfortable? As Gogo explains, the pots have to be carried to fill them with water and washed at the end of the day. These pots are extremely heavy. By changing the door to the window to a door at the top of the plan, the tap is more easily accessible and the pots are not carried as far. Secondly, we can see how the space is very cramped with the extra folding table. If we consider these granular changes, the space becomes easier to maneuver. The door to the left can become a solar chimney, improving ventilation and freeing up space for storage, currently a big issue for Gogo. With just a few small but powerful gestures, we have eased the congested space. The toolkit also examines questions of lighting. Gogo's kitchen operates during daylight hours, from around 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. So generally, natural light is the most effective. Positioning equipment nearest to doors and windows is preferred, and outside is used where possible. For questions of ventilation, doors and windows are kept open where possible, using passive cross ventilation, and improved with the addition of a solar chimney. What we have learned from Gogo can be sensitively applied in other spaces that house soup kitchens in her community network. 
a church is common. What we learn from Gogo is to always position the pots near to the tap and keep operations near openings where possible. Daylight is the best source of light, so utilizing outdoor where possible is recommended. Passive ventilation is also generally sufficient in such a large space, and keeping windows and doors open for cross ventilation is safest. Soup kitchens operate from open spaces as well. These are perhaps the safest from a lighting as well as ventilation point of view. Some kitchens operate out of shipping containers, in this case, setting up operations outside if there's space on the street is safest. This means daylight can be the main source of light and ventilation is less of an issue. So these changes are things that can be done today or tomorrow to respond to immediate needs, making the operation safer. More than this, however, the kitchens form places of civicness in Gugulatu, which was long designed to lack them. Working within these constraints, could the solar chimney be imagined as something more? a market in the landscape, denoting places where one can get a hot meal, but also hang around, something recognisable as part of this network of soup kitchens. The final section of the toolkit talks about methodology. It includes transcripts of the interviews by people in both the Cape Flats and the city centre that I conducted, and it contains screenshots and information about our attempts to get registered as an NGO. These are vital to our understanding that practicing architecture in this context is often negotiating, compromising and circumventing. My work therefore finally asks you to imagine what it would be like if soup kitchens like Gogos were rolled out under these new legislative ameliorations. Reforms have been made allowing a spectrum application of compliance in community care zones. The incremental development of a civic district might be facilitated. More of them might pop up next to the library on a busy intersection, next to the church, in the park, or animating dangerous corners of Gugulatu. I imagine that by facilitating the network of soup kitchens that share resources, information and funding, we might ultimately begin to repair the discontinuities left by the failing state, creating a new civic district. Where gatherings might be held, food could be bought, sold and traded, and reparative work can be enacted across scales and modalities, facilitating the neighbourhood's civic space as a way to galvanise the community's flourishing, embedding the spirit of Ubuntu. At the same time, working to repair our methodologies in architecture and planning by reconsidering our top-down legislative standards as only continuing to reproduce spatial segregation. Instead, we should learn from resilient infrastructures that already work, such as Gogos, and work outwards.